Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 380, featuring the first of a new uh, series of interviews with Mr. Robert Clardy, aka Bob Clardy, the founder of Synergistic Software and the creator of some of the earliest examples of the computer role-playing game uh, that you and I uh, both know and love. Now, uh, Bob's games haven't gotten enough attention, I don't think. Uh, not a lot of people even know about these games. So a dungeon. A campaign, Wilderness Campaign, Odyssey, The Complete Adventure. Uh, so hopefully we'll remedy that uh, here today, at least uh, uh, for you guys, because I think you really uh, enjoy Bob. He's got a lot of great stories about uh, pretty much all aspects of the uh, dawn of the video game, and as well as the home computer industry. Anyway, there's a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Bob Clardy. All right, folks, I am here with the great Bob Clardy. He is the founder of Synergistic Software, Programmer and developer, designer of some of the earliest computer role-playing games, including uh, uh, Odyssey, the complete adventure, or <laughs> the complete app venture, I should say, from 1980. And then before that, he's even got games going back before that to uh, uh, the late 70s. D done a lot of uh, ports and all kinds of software besides games, and just a <laughs> all-around fascinating guy. So I think we're going to have a very good conversation today. But how are you today, Bob? Doing good, good, good. The uh, weather here in Seattle has just returned to its normal dreary rain, so uh, I'm glad to be indoors talking to you instead of uh, out on the dock trying to find sun anywhere. <laughs> yeah, we've been having that kind of weather here in Minnesota. First beautiful day today, I think. We we get at least a week of summer here. Mm. You know, I don't know what <laughs> is similar in Seattle. <laughs> we usually do better, but this year it's been the rain is really hanging on. It's uh, it's supposed to have ended by now, but no. Not yet. <laughs> Supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's uh, jump into this. Uh, you know, you were a guy who was there at the very ground level, you know, at the very start of this thing we call the games industry today. Really, the soft computer industry in general, I suppose. Mm. Uh, and you were talking about uh, before how you were prepping for a career that didn't really exist. I guess you had a vision for what you wanted to do. <laughs> kind of pr prognosticator there. Uh, it, it wasn't so much a vision. A vision kind of uh, implies that I planned it, and I didn't. I kind of stumbled into it. It was more of a uh, – between college and, between high school and college, I took a first introductory computer class and got to program a game, and that was, I was hooked on the idea. But when I got to college, there were, there were no computer majors. There were no – I mean, there was electrical engineering classes that taught, taught you hardware. There were math science classes that taught you theory. But there were no programming classes, per se, and uh, at the time I went, Rice University in 71. So uh, it was uh, something I wanted, something I was interested in, but there just wasn't any way to get there. So I, was, uh, I studied all the things related to it, but uh, I had no idea where you could go with that. So I got a job you know, coming out of that. Uh, since I had been in the electrical engineering department, I came out and got an electrical engineering job. That's where the jobs were with uh, Boeing Company and waited until somehow I could actually get into the computer industry someday. Um, the only real computer jobs that I saw available were with IBM. They, they looked so scary to me, you know. <laughs> scary. <laughs> it's scary. You know, those white shirts, narrow black ties, ooh, oh, they're just yeah. kind of creepy. They, I couldn't, I, I could not see myself there. Very, and, corp uh, very definition of a corporate culture. Corporate, yes, indeed. So anyway, so I was looking for something that wasn't there. Uh, and it, it did finally show up in uh, 78 when I got my Apple. Uh, it showed up a little before that, but I wasn't persuaded by the the TRS-80 and the, you know, the, the computers <laughs> that, that didn't have any graphics to them it just didn't really sway me as being fun. But the, the Apple came out in 78. That one looked very interesting. So you so, ran out and grabbed one right off the assembly line? Uh, I was not the earliest, but I was pretty early. It was uh, summer of 78, so it was pretty early. My Apple had yeah. 16K of RAM, so... It was a really a, a whopping 16K. <laughs> Woo, yeah. 
Yes. Wow. And a cassette tape recorder to, to load and store programs and an RF modulator so I can watch it on my TV set. And it was, uh, it was a complicated and slow and tedious process, but it was a blast. That was a, that was a fun time. Well, that's good to hear. I imagine after working on, I guess you programmed on mainframes and stuff like that before, right? So did yep. you feel like the yep. Apple II, did you feel confined with that or was it more? Oh, it was, uh, God, it's hard to describe. It was uh, very exciting. It was, you know, we had complete freedom to actually, you know, do anything you want. I didn't have to deal with operators. You know, there was no submitting a card deck and waiting till you got scheduled in the queue and then waiting for your printouts to be handed back. No, I had this computer on my desk. I could do anything I wanted with it. And uh, it was it was a very exhilarating time period to uh, to feel you actually had control of your computer for once. That was that was all new to me. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you joined this this club at APPLE Apple Club. I did. Did uh, you meet any of the luminaries? Uh? Well, I, I knew everybody that was involved with the club at the time. Val Golding was the founder, and I met him the the first meeting I went to. Uh, it was just him and a couple of other uh, dick hubert was there um i don't know if any of the other you ever main... run into waz or oh yeah yeah waz would come and visit occasionally and we got the apple club got a lot of uh uh unique documentation about the apple computer from waz he'd, he'd bring us stuff that you know notes that uh, needed to be collated and cleaned up and published and uh, Apple Computer just wasn't getting around to it at that time, so we kind of worked with him and others. Andy Hertzfeld was another conduit for information that helped us a lot. Uh, yeah, it was it was really cool. You know, at the time, I didn't. I mean, Apple wasn't the big company it is now, so you know, Waz dropping by wasn't didn't seem like that big a deal. He, he was just another one of the hackers that was interested in computers and just a. You know, an, a, a regular guy, not a corporate executive type. And, uh, so it didn't seem that unusual when we saw. We didn't see him a lot. He didn't come up a lot. He came up a couple times, though. I'll tell you one one time that was particularly notable, though, that was fun. God, when was this? 82, I think. Um, Roger Wagner hosted a hang gliding party that uh, he invited Waz hang to. Hang gliding and, party. Hang gliding, <laughs> yes. I, I don't know how he came up with it. It was uh, That was the theme. We went down to San Diego, and he took us to the beach, and we went hang gliding. And uh, Waz showed up for that, and it was uh, uh, Gary Carlston was there, and a, a bunch of uh, uh, Andy Hertzfeld was back. There were a whole bunch of early Apple people that came to there. And it was, again, I mean, by that time, Apple Computer, that was 82, so Apple Computer was really taking off. Apple Computer had taken off. And uh, Waz, in fact, had already gotten tired of being there. He had he was in the middle of a hiatus himself. He had just left um, Apple because he didn't want to be a, 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 a manager. And uh, again, I, he hadn't changed a bit. He was just another hacker uh, in, in this group of hackers and uh, casual, easygoing, laid back, friend, fun loving guy. Uh, it was it was a real blast. But. Shortly after that, I began to take, you know, Apple seriously. I mean, as a, as a, you know, a major company, a corporate behemoth that was in, you know, beginning to happen. But mm -hmm. for that, it had just been, uh, it'd been a hobby. It had been a passion, but. So you're working for Boeing, I guess, and decided to, you know, what, what made you make the decision to quit that and launch your own enterprise? Uh, two things. Um, I had, well, first off. I had been waiting for the for something like the Apple since you know I was out of high school. This is what I really was looking to do. I just didn't know of any way to well a to to be able to afford to do it myself. I couldn't afford to buy a mainframe, so <laughs> yeah. and I didn't want to work. Yeah, those are what, a couple hundred thousand dollars or something. You like know, that. I, I I was saving up for it, but I I only had seventy five <laughs> saved. It was going to take a while, but. No, but uh, no. The main thing though was working for Bo Boeing is a great company. It still is a great company, and to work for as an engineer, they it's a but um, it's a big corporation. And the projects I was working on had huge teams, and uh, sometimes you know engineers just had to be there because we need everybody on the team to be there in case they need you. And there's not necessarily so I. I I was working on the AWACS radar program for a while, for instance, and 
and uh, they were working three shifts at the time. And sometimes there wasn't all that much to do, but they did it anyway. So we showed up, you had to be there in case they needed you. And sometimes you just had to keep busy. I hated that. Absolutely hated that. So, uh, you know, I felt like I was a cog in the machine that, and it wasn't a very important cog necessarily. And so, uh, when the Apple came out and I, my, my wife was an accountant at the time. So I was very fortunate that I had, uh, I had a fallback position. If I, if I quit my engineering job and tried something experimental and it didn't work out, the accountant here could pay for it. So <laughs> the key was going. Well, now, how thrilled was she about this? Oh, good. <laughs> she thought that was a great idea. No. Oh, great idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'd been talking about it for years. So uh, she knew that this was something I had to try. Neither one of us expected it to be a career. Uh, we expected it to be something I had try for a little while and then I'd find a, a real job again. But maybe something in computers now. But but still, we didn't really expect, at least I didn't expect that this would turn into uh, a long-term business. Mm -hmm. But it did. You know, it was very gradual. I started out as a, you know, doing something for fun, a hobby, a passionate, you know, adventure. But um, it gradually did build into a business. And every time that happened, I tried to kind of back off from that. I didn't really like being a manager. Oh, yeah. I'd rather programmer or, or maybe a game maker, one of those two, but not management. That just never appealed to me, but I kept drifting into it. And you know, what's that phrase, killed by your own success or something like that? The yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I was a good Peter Principal example. Peter Principal, there we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah pro, what know, is it, promoted to the – what is that? Prom, you get promoted to the level of incompetence or something like that? That's it. That's yeah. it. That's, <laughs> when, when you – yeah. Yeah, no, I, I kind of felt that way. And I, you know, we looked for partners, we looked for mergers, we looked for some way to, you know, that I could kind of get get back down a level or two. And it just didn't, it never worked out for us. We we had several opportunities over the years, and they all blew up in our faces when the time came around. But uh, so it, it, you know, it ended up being a small um development operation that, that gave me a wide range of experience with with all kinds of computers and all kinds of publishers and all types of software. Yeah. And I did enjoy all of that. You know Never a lot liked. of work with uh, porting games to other systems, not just the Apple II. You did some Atari 8-bit stuff. and We did. How many Those systems? Are <laughs> How many? Uh, yeah. I don't have a list in front of me, but Atari 800, uh, the VIC... 20, oh, the Victoria, Commodore 64. Um, later, those are the ones I worked on. Uh, Super Nintendo, I worked on that. Uh, every version of Apple, Apple II, 2 2GS, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, IBM PC, Macintosh, Atari ST, Amiga, a lot, a lot of different computers. Those were I didn't work on those. Those were people I, I hired for. But uh, uh, but I, I got involved in all of them. You know, you had to be kind of familiar with. What can these machines do when you when you're planning a port or deciding whether you're going to accept a port? You have to know, you know, can this machine do that kind of game? Yeah. And uh, so I got familiar with all of them. That was a blast too. I, I enjoy learning about the hardware. Yeah, I don't think people nowadays appreciate how easy it is. You basically have a choice between what Windows and Mac, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe Linux if you want to, you know, if you want to go that route. Though you know what you're doing. Uh, but we're talking about a time when you could buy a computer, and maybe a couple months later there wouldn't be any software for it, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, it was. It was those, you know, as they each came out, you know, all the tools that you need just weren't there yet, and so that was always the first thing we did was well, first thing we did was learn what it can do, and write some demos, and find out what tools were needed, and then we had to write the tools, and that was. Every new machine started that way with us. It was, and early on we would sell the tools, thinking that was, yeah. you know, that everybody cared about that. No, nobody else but us and, and <laughs> the game makers. But, but so, um, you know, we still it was that was a fun part of of, of seeing these new machines was uh, learning what they could do, finding out how what they could, how you can take advantage of it to make something more compelling than than that last generation, the text only adventures or something. <laughs> All right, so let's get into this first game. I guess this is your first game, Dungeon Campaign. Dungeon was my first game. December um, 1978. 
that was when it was published. I started it. I got my Apple, I think, in July and started writing software in August of 78. And Dungeon Campaign was finished sometime in November, I guess. And we started selling it in December. So, I mean, it was a really accelerated schedule of development in those days. And it was a pathetically small game. This was 16K of RAM we had to work with. So there wasn't much to it. It was written in Integer Basic, so it's not the most efficient language. Integer so, Basic, yeah, I'm not. Why is it called Integer Basic? It it had no floating point arithmetic. It had you can only do integers. The largest number it could handle was thirty two thousand seven hundred sixty seven. So <laughs> that that was a problem with my early games. I didn't have limits on say how much gold you can ac you can accumulate. So. You know, if you play the game the way I did, you just maybe ended up with 10,000 in gold. But when you hand it out to teenage boys who do all kinds of crazy stuff, they, they crash the program <laughs> because it couldn't handle the numbers they were they were trying to accumulate. So it's uh, integer basic. That was a uh, uh, Wozniak wrote that. And it was a, a simplified, stripped down version of the other basic languages that were on the mainframe. So basic, was, basic, <laughs> basic, basic. That's it. <laughs> Well, this was still a pretty ambitious game. I mean, I was uh, I saw it described a couple of different ways. I like I like this I think on Moby Games they were calling it a, a rogue like before rogue was a thing. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Yeah. You know, I guess I could sort of see where they're going. But there's there's a certain amount of uh, I guess you'd call it procedural gener generation or randomized elements to this so you can replay it over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of my games were always like that. I never wanted to do games that were kind of, you know, a fixed adventure on rails where you had to, you know, do what the author had in mind for you. That, I, I just never liked that. I was, I, I had played uh, Dungeons and Dragons in college. I was always the dungeon master. And uh, so I, I wanted games like that, where uh, as the dungeon master, I set up an environment, I set up the conditions, I set up where the, the bad guys are and where the treasures are. But then you hand it over to the players, and the players make all the decisions, and they sometimes do something completely different. And you have to make the game able to support that. That mm -hmm. was, I've always done that kind of a game. So Dungeon started out that way, and yeah, every every game was unique, and you could play it over and over and over. Theoretically, <laughs> I don't know how many people did that. I, it was a graphically, it was pathetic. I mean, it was uh, forty by forty eight pixels on the screen. Those are big friggin' pixels, and uh, you know you have little blocks of color moving around, and based on the color, you could tell whether that's uh, a good guy or a bad guy. So it was uh, it was pretty limited, but still, it was better than anything I'd seen before. Yeah, at least it wasn't the, the ASCII character set. <laughs> yes, yeah, black and white yeah. was does get old. <laughs> well, this is a uh, pretty. I don't know too many games. And, that let you have this large of a party, right? Because it's 25 men, you know, in this game. And I was thinking about this because, uh, I don't know, I'm, yeah, I think you have actually read those uh, at the uh, CRPG Addict, Chet's yep. uh, uh, reviews of these games. You know, he's talking, I, I love his stuff because he kind of gets into some design questions on there. But he was talking there a little bit about the, uh, the fact that these uh, men are kind of abstract, I guess, and, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, you don't name them, I suppose, and have like individual stats for all the, the party. Uh, but actually, I don't know if I could would consider that to be a negative thing, because I kind of like you, I think, would agree with this, right? That uh, it's not such a good thing for the designer to put too much of his own, you know, spin on something like your party, right? Or, you know, wh where do you draw the line between, uh, this just let the, the player imagine this uh, versus we need to, to spell it all out? Well, a good question, and it, and it really depends on the kind of game you're doing. Um, in, in a role-playing game, you want the player to build their own characters. Now, in this case, there wasn't a human character to build. The player was the leader, hmm. and, and he had a force, a team, that he managed. And uh, so in, in his own mind, he could put any characteristics he want on himself. Uh, but there were, yeah, you don't, but we're not telling a story here. This is not... Um, uh, Lord of the Rings, and you know every member of the party is a unique character that uh, has to be uniquely developed. Now it wasn't that kind of a role playing game. I did try to do some of those later, but even there, I didn't want um, 
the story to be dependent on any particular mm -hmm. character. You could play any of the characters you wanted and uh, build up any character you wanted. Um, so, but in this early game, really the, 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 the men were, were kind of life points more than anything else. They, they were a, a scorekeeping tool. How well you're doing, if they, whether you whether the party will survive. But again, as depending on the player, the player may personify these these people and and feel really bad when one of them croaks. <laughs> <laughs> and we had two of them. There were two. There was an elf and a dwarf that were important. And out of your 25, you know, whenever you had a combat situation uh, and somebody was going to die, we would have a you know, okay, how many are left? There's 10 left. Okay, there's a one out of 10 chance you're going to lose the elf or the dwarf. They each did things for you. So the uh, the elf could detect where uh, hazards are, pit traps, secret doors, things like that. And he would they would show up as you got near them. You would see them on the map and realize, ah, there's something here that I can take advantage of or run from. The dwarf would make the maps. So if either one of them died, the game changed. And it, and it was significant. You didn't want to lose them. So, <laughs> the men, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> now it was it was the team. You had to keep your team intact, and this was meant to be a, a team game, not a not a one man adventure game. Which most of the adventures that had come out at that time were that type. They were they were usually on rails. They usually had a fixed path, and they usually had one guy. And if he right. died, that was the end of the game. That was another thing I didn't like. I didn't. I didn't want games to end just because I was, you know, trying to extend the gameplay experience. Oh, kill them off, make them start over. No, that's really <laughs> boring to me. So um, this was a way to avoid that. That's a good good way to go, I think. Mm. Uh, another thing I liked about this game is the the way the dice rolls work, being interactive and giving you that sort of illusion that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, if I just oh, there we go, you know. <laughs> if I only pushed it a little bit faster, I saw that. I saw that twelve go by. Ah, I missed it again. Damn it! You think anybody was ever fast enough to get the rolls they wanted every time? I don't know if that was possible. It might be. It, it might have been. I, I don't remember now. I'd have to play with it again. <laughs> you know, we did the same thing when we drew the maze. Uh, you know, it took Energy Basic was not a very speedy language, so generating the maze took a while. So uh, when I first wrote the game, I just had a black screen. and You'd sit there staring at a black screen for way too long. So I thought, okay, let's display the maze as it's generated. And, they, and people would sit there fascinated trying to memorize it. But there were four <laughs> levels. So you memorize the first one, and then another one starts up, and it totally screws you up. You can never remember anything by the end of it. But it always gave that illusion. And, it, and that was the goal there, to have the player have something to do, something to try to, to beat the game or outsmart game while he had to sit there and wait <laughs> so you would be uh, great at running a casino <laughs> <laughs> flashing lights a lot of bells <laughs> well let's uh, talk then about the uh, wilderness wilderness campaign okay i guess this was about a year later right uh it started immediately after dungeon um two things had happened to that year uh I guess even in that earliest version of the Apple, there was a high-res graphic mode. But it took up so much memory on a 16K Apple that you had very little space left for a program. So I couldn't use it. But I I, I lusted after it. You know, high-res graphic. Uh, high-res. Oh, that was so cool. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to do a high-res game, but there wasn't enough memory to really support it. So, But that year, the Apple II Plus came out. And the Apple II Plus had 48K of RAM, and now high-res games were possible. So I bought my upgrade uh, sometime in there, but the, as soon as Dungeon started shipping, I started writing Wilderness Campaign, and it came out. It took, I think it took four or five months, so it was a much bigger development effort than, uh, than Dungeon had been. Well, let's, if you don't mind, uh, just hmm. how was Dungeon selling at this point? I mean, was it a best-selling game, or...? And how, it was was this like one of those Ziploc baggy style games? Absolutely. How did you get this into the? Yeah, it was pathetic. Um, <laughs> and but it was also as good as there was at the time. Yeah. I mean, I uh, when we went to the stores, the Computer Lands, and I don't remember what, uh, Empire Electronics was another one that was near us. Uh, there was stuff on the shelves, but nothing uh, like what's behind you on your shelves. That you know, nothing that looked like. A professional was involved in it at all. <laughs> so yes, I, More I of a hand, home brew have, kind of a yeah, you don't have industry. dungeon sitting around there. I, I, <laughs> I don't think I have one here. Oh, I wish I did. 
Uh, well, anyway, I it was I had hand drawn, you know, xeroxed copies of the documents. I, I used good paper, but it was really, really cheapo manufacturing. And we stuck it in a Ziploc bag, and it had a cassette tape. You would record three copies of the uh, of the game on every tape because they were very. Um, uh, very difficult to load. Sometimes you'd get a, the slightest flaw and it'd blow the whole copy. So we had to put three copies on every tape. It took forever to manufacture the darn things. And, uh, and, and then as far as uh, selling them, there wasn't yet, uh, the, the middlemen weren't there, uh, the distributors that would get you to all the stores. So you had to contact each store individually and ask them to carry your product. And many of them would, and they'd buy two or three copies or even more likely they would say, you can put two or three copies on our shelves, and if it sells, we'll pay you for it. So that was how we got started. And, and the numbers were really pretty small in those days, not enough to you know, have a company live off of at all. Uh, it, gra it grew fairly quickly. Um, I'm not sure when it, let's see, probably after Wilderness uh, was when it began to be large enough numbers. So middle of 79 late 79 we were we actually had some distribution network beginning to get established and uh you know you could you could fill the pipeline and that would pay pay operations for a couple of months so just it, it, it began to become a business in 79. when did you do the atari 8-bit version of a dungeon campaign or uh um, 1980, I think. So that was quite a bit, a couple of years later. It was a couple of years later, yeah. Uh, I, I bought my uh, Atari 8-bit not to do games. It was a great game machine. I really enjoyed that machine because uh, it had all this cool hardware that was specific for games. That was that was neat. But that isn't why I bought it. Uh, I, needed a, I needed a computer that could do lower case so I could write <laughs> letters. <laughs> And the Apple II yeah. didn't have it at that time. So I bought the Atari 800 and a product called Apple, I uh, know, Atari Writer. Atari Writer. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was, my, that was my word processor. And uh, that's why I bought it. But then I realized, <laughs> hey, this is a game machine, too. It came with this nifty joystick, and we didn't get any joysticks on the Apple. So, so I started looking into it. It was, and as with the Apple, publisher, I mean, excuse me, um, well, publishing companies that wanted Atari games were beginning to pop. So, did you have better luck with the Apple II version or the Atari? Uh, Apple II, uh, yeah. Atari was was a better game, but I was able to sell Apple II because I was known in that market. I wasn't really uh, synergistic. Never got you know known in these other markets. We mostly most of the work we did for other computers was through publishers that were known in those markets, and we didn't get into that for quite some time. So it took us a while. I think it was in um, 83, I guess, was uh, when Atari kind of encouraged us to get into more and more computers and uh, act mm -hmm. as a publisher. And that that changed our business radically. Hmm. So. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about Wilderness Campaign. Okay. Uh, so you had mentioned that there's a lot more power at your disposal at this point. It, the game has, uh, I guess you went from 25 to 10 uh, campaigners, but you have more stats in the, into the mix at this point, right? Uh, yeah, there were a lot more stats, uh, how much you can carry. Um, hunger you, and thirst. A hunger and thirst, yeah. And you had to, you had to buy food. You, had to, uh, you, could, you could recruit additional people, uh, either fighters or porters. And, uh, you know, so you could have a fairly large party. It, depending on how you wanted to play the game, you could spend a lot of your time just building up a huge army, and it was possible to play that way. I found it boring. Uh, I wanted to have the minimal role-playing party necessary to go complete the mission, but some people spent their time building armies, and and but then you have to equip them and kept them fed and yeah. barter with with merchants and try to you know find enough gold to pay for it all. And after a while, you run out of gold because there were a limited number of. Uh, Ruins and temples to search to find find stray gold. What was it? Quadroons, I think, or quadroons. Yeah, yeah that, that was an embarrassing <laughs> choice. I, 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 I just meant it as twice as valuable as doubloons. But in my own mind, that's what it meant. <laughs> but, but other people thought of it as being. Uh, isn't that isn't that a, a kind of a slang term for mulatto or or? Uh, oh, really? Uh, I don't. I don't know. 
a biracial person at the time, and it wasn't. Uh, some people thought I was being insulting in that regard, but it was no. It was just a <laughs> lame joke <laughs> about the quadroons. Yes, the uh, the the currency of the realm. Is it you can buy a mule in that one, right? To- uh, yeah, I'd kind of forgotten about. There's a long list, uh, and I don't have the document sitting here. To, a long list of things you can get in the game. And, yeah, I think a mule was one of them. And if you bought a mule, you could carry a lot more stuff. Yeah, so that uh, idea has been around for a while. Always, it was in, I think it shows up in Dungeon Siege much later on. I thought, oh, this is such an innovative idea to have a mule <laughs> help you carry your loot. But it, I guess we had that idea out as early as <laughs> 1979. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> again, it, it came from, you know, running uh, D&D campaigns in college. You know, that was the kind of stuff that my gaming group did. OK, anything they ever wanted to do, I wanted it in my game. So, uh, yeah, it had to be in there. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Clardy. A lot of lots of uh, lots and lots of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. I know you're going to enjoy it very much. As always, I want to thank you, 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 and uh, by the way, thank you for your support of this show. You're keeping these episodes coming. Uh, you know, somebody like Bob Clardy uh, doesn't get as much interviews as some of the more uh, you know showboating types, uh, shall we say. So I really enjoy uh, getting to talk to somebody like that, uh, getting to bring you some stories that you probably wouldn't hear uh, any other way from uh, any other place, right? So uh, just, I couldn't do it alone. Just want to say thank you for this. You're helping me uh, do what I enjoy, and hopefully (laughs) uh, what I do, uh, you enjoy. Did I have a point here? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Oh, thank you. Uh, If you would like to support the show and you haven't already, just go to that link in the show notes to the... uh, uh, Patreon site or the mattchat.us site. Uh, lots of ways you can chip in. Uh, I appreciate uh, anything you do, whether it's uh, donating a buck a show, uh, telling somebody else about the show, <laughs> just, uh, watching the show, commenting on it, uh, whatever it is you can do. Uh, I really appreciate it, so thank you. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Key? Quite a bit of news uh, since last week. Uh, Matthew sent this in, Matthew Weymouth, on the uh, Milky Way Incorporated Super Secret uh, Facebook uh, group. I probably should even have mentioned that, so uh, just please uh, forget I mentioned that. Uh, anyway, he sent this in. This is a 20 sided die, uh, <laughs> aka an icosahedron, uh, with faces inscribed with Greek letters. Now, this came uh, from Egypt sometime between 2nd century and 4th century A.D., and apparently there's quite a few of these that have been found. I guess the archaeologists don't really know the purpose uh, of these. <laughs> Maybe it might not have had anything to do with gaming, uh, but could have been. Maybe they were playing some form of uh, <laughs> Dungeons and Gi- Dungeons and Dragons, or I guess what, uh, uh, pyramids and tombs or something. Who knows? Uh, anyway, I thought that was cool, so thank you, uh, Matthew, for that. Uh, Shane wrote in with a couple items here. Uh, one is a big news for us. So in Exile, or in Exile, uh, gets $4.5 million investment from Gumi for an open world survival RPG slash VR game. Now, again, not a lot known about this at the, t- at the moment. It could be some kind of wasteland thing, a torment thing, maybe even a bard's tell uh, thing. It, maybe even <laughs> the Hunted the Demon's Forge came up in this article. Uh, wow. Uh, that's, that's quite a few options on the table, I suppose, but uh, hopefully we'll be hearing more about that. Uh, it really makes me even more curious about VR. I've been kind of holding off, you know, Oculus, Rift, uh, uh, Vive, you know, all this stuff. I don't know what is worth the money yet. I don't want to get burned. Uh, so I might just wait and see what happens here. And maybe that will be the, uh, the final push I need to get into this whole VR thing. Uh, Shane also wrote in about a interview he did on his show uh, with Portalarium's uh, Star Long and Matthew Anderson. And they're on a Shane show to talk about uh, Shroud of the Avatar. So I know some of you are uh, playing that or interested in that. So go, go check it out. I'll post a link to that uh, in the show notes. And then uh, related news, uh, Adam, uh, Adam Dayton, friend of uh, Matt Chat as well, 
Uh, he's going to have uh, Becky Berger Hindman on his uh, show, Moonhawk Studios Presents. That will be Wednesday at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so hopefully you'll get this in time. Uh, if not, just do a search for Moonhawk Studios Presents. And that's a live show. Uh, so you might actually be able to call in. I'm, I'm not really sure what he's got planned for her, but uh, it might be some way for you to call in or at least present some questions for him and his uh, co-host to ask Becky. So anyway, I just post a link to it and you can go check it out. And then uh, finally, Stig uh, wrote in with this, some really good news. Uh, two free games on GOG, goodoldgames.com. We've got uh, Jotun Valhalla Edition. This is a hand-drawn action exploration game set in a Norse mythology. And then there's a Shadow Warrior Classic Complete, a controversial game from the creators of Duke Nukem 3D. It's a first-person shooter that quote-unquote takes the build engine to its extreme limits. Now these are both free, but only uh, for the next 18 hours as I'm recording this at this moment. Uh, so uh, I don't know what time you're getting this, but hopefully uh, you have checked it uh, before then. It's going to be a shame to miss out on two free, completely free, no strings attached games. So good luck with that. And uh, thank you, Stig, for writing uh, <laughs> or telling me about that so I could pick them up. All right. Ooh, a lot of news. You know what I could use? Some fine ale. And it just so happens uh, I happen to have some fine ale right here in this fantastic reliquary. Pull this sucker out. And look what we've got here. The La Fin du Monde. La Fin du Monde. <laughs> Uh, from the ooh, I think this is uni brew or ooh brew or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I looked this up right before I did this, and I've already forgotten how to pronounce this. But you know, if you don't know how to pronounce La Fin de Mon and you don't know what it means, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, you got that. <laughs> anyway, it's a Belgian style triple L. It's my favorite absolute thing is a Belgian style triple. And this is what, exactly what we have here. It's 9% alcohol by volume. It says uh, L brewed with the uh, spices and bottle re-fermented. Uh, lots of stuff here on the back. I won't read all this. Uh, let's see. Uh, these guys are based in Canada, a place called Chambly or Chambly. Unibrew. <laughs> yeah, I swear the, the pronunciation was like boo, ooey boo or something like that. You guys are probably laughing at me. That's fine because I've got the ale. Uh, let's see, anything else interesting there? Beer originally developed in the Middle Ages by Trappist monks. Follow, let's, okay. Golden ale, mildly yeasty, with notes of malt. <laughs> uh, no comment. Uh, fruit and spice, uh, followed by a smooth, dry finish. All right, anyway, it all sounds good. I love this style ale, uh, so I can't wait to get this open and see what it's all about. Uh, so this has got one of these fun little cork corkscrew type devices. I always think it's kind of fun to open these and see if we can, uh, if I can hit the camera with it. Probably not the safest thing. You probably don't want to be pointing that at your face as you're trying to open it. Let's see if I can hit it. Uh, hang on. Woo! <laughs> I just barely missed. All right, so I got some Le Fin de Mon here in this. Uh, that's a pretty excellent drinking glass, but you know, I think I can do a little better than this. I think we'll be drinking this ale from this rather excellent drinking horn. Ale, yes. Let's pour it in. I'm still trying to get used to this uh, new and improved horn. You know, it's uh, it takes a little getting used to with a drinking horn. <laughs> but the more ale you drink, the easier it gets somehow. I don't, it's kind of weird. Usually it's the opposite with something like that, but drinking horns, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I don't even want to drink this. I'm, I'm just, I'm content just to smell this stuff. My God, that smells good. It's, it's, a, it's like a champagne, uh, kind of a citrusy champagne, if you could imagine sort of a, a champagne, maybe with even some Mountain Dew or Sprite mixed in. You know, it's just a really, really pleasant aroma on this. I guess that's the spices they put in, but anyway, it smells really good. Kind of like the, if you can imagine a blue moon, but much, much better. <laughs> uh, that's what we're getting at here. So let me see if I can sample this brew. Mm, that's very uh, refreshing, actually. 
A lot lighter tasting than I would have expected. Uh, you definitely taste those citrus, that citrus, uh, citrusy taste right off the bat. It's sort of vaguely weedy uh, uh, taste as well. Kind of a, almost sort of a honey-like uh, flavor there at the, at the back end of this. Let me try it again. I mean, this really does go down super smooth. Uh, I think I had something like 9% uh, alcohol or something like that in there. Don't taste it, alcohol at all. I mean, this you could tell me this was a 0% alcohol. I would probably uh, believe that. Instead, what you really taste are those uh, sort of triple flavors. Uh, like I said, this sort of champagne-like flavor. Uh, the, uh, the sort of weedy flavor. A little, there's something else in there I can't quite place. Uh, I'm not sure what spices they put in. Let me see if I can... I try it uh, one more time and identify that secret spice. God, what is that? Maybe like coriander? Maybe a little bit of a, maybe a lemon rind, a lemon rind or something like that. Uh, it's definitely got some s strong citrusy uh, flavors to it, so I'm guessing it's something like that. I uh, don't taste anything like cinnamon in here, but, uh, you know, <laughs> could be wrong. I'll try it one more time. Ah. Anyway, just a really, really good brew on this. Um, you know, I don't... Belgian-style triple L. So I think they they nailed that. I don't know if I would prefer this to an actual uh, Belgian-style... Or an actual Belgian L, but it's pretty darn close. And I'll tell you, it's a heck of a lot cheaper, too. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go full uh, 5 out of 5 drinking horns on this. Extremely tasty. Uh, very smooth, very refreshing, exactly what you want on a really hot day, I think. You don't want some kind of dark, uh, you know, thick IPA or something. You, you want something more uh, uh, more crisp than that, and I think this will do the uh, do the job quite nicely. So, uh, five out of five on this La Fin du Monde. All right, so let's uh, wrap this up, and I was uh, looking for quotes about engineers... Because, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, we talked quite a bit about that uh, in, this, uh, in this episode. And I come across this little story. I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, it goes something like this. Once upon a time, the fence between heaven and hell broke down. St. Peter appeared at the broken section and called out to the devil. Hey, Satan, since all the engineers are over in your place, how about getting them to fix this fence? Sorry, replied Satan. <laughs> My men are all too busy to go about fixing measly fences. Well then, replied St. Peter, I'll have to sue you if you don't. Oh yeah, commented the devil. And where are you going to get a lawyer? <laughs> Love that. Anyway, I'll see you guys next week. Gosh, yeah. Really got some nice toys here.